Um, this is the closing argument exercise, and I'm going to be starting off with the closing argument for the defense counsel. Good evening once again, members of the jury, counsel. I would like to start off today by posing a couple of questions to all of you. Um, mostly, I'm wondering if any of you have ever made mistakes before. Have you maybe ever said something that you weren't proud of? Um, have you ever gotten into an argument before? Maybe some of you sitting here today had a rough start on life. Uh, if you haven't, you definitely know somebody who has because uh, these are very common things in our society. Now, my client Gerald here has made some mistakes in his life. The state tried to make you very aware of those today. What they don't want you to be aware of is the fact that they don't have a single shred of concrete evidence or physical, any physical evidence for that matter, that puts my client in that alleyway where that awful attack took place. My client, Gerald Harris, after a long day of work, gets a call from an old friend of his. He feels bad for that friend because he couldn't hire him at this company that he painstakingly worked so hard to build up. So what does he do? He decides to take him out and show him a good time at a wrestling show. And then they go for a drink. Now, um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the saying that no good deed goes unpunished. Well, this whole situation, I would say, is a perfect example of that. Now, the state spent a lot of time explaining to you what happened at that bar. You heard about an altercation. Um, you heard about some words that may have been said. And my client deeply regrets all of this, but I want you all to take a moment to focus on something that I believe is entirely more important here. What haven't you heard today? Notice how the state tiptoes around the fact that there is no physical evidence to show that Gerald was in that alleyway where the attack took place to Mr. Henry Fordyce. That, ladies and gentlemen, is reasonable doubt. Notice how they also tiptoe away from the amount of alcohol that Henry Fordyce consumed. He was found with a blood alcohol content of 0.15, which as you know is way above the legal limit. And that's only what was found after he was taken to the hospital, which is several hours after he began drinking. That, ladies and gentlemen, is reasonable doubt. He couldn't remember key details that occurred at the bar between him and my client. But the state wants you to believe that he saw my client in the alleyway after he had even more to drink and was hit in the head so hard with a blunt object that he suffered skull fractures. That, ladies and gentlemen, is also reasonable doubt. I want you all to consider these things that they refuse to think about. Counsel for the state is going to stand up here and make some final remarks next after I'm done. They're going to ask you, like I am, to consider all of the evidence that has been brought here before you today when you depart to the deliberation room. I want to go through, I'm sorry, I want you to go through all of the exhibits and reread all the documents that we have shown you today. While you are sifting through that material, I want you to ask yourself which of these places Mr. Harris at that scene in the alley. This is something you're simply not going to be able to do. Ask yourself also, what proves that my client did this? This is something that you're not going to be able to do because there isn't anything other than the words of criminals, alcoholics, and drug addicts that suggests this. That is not, ladies and gentlemen, what we convict people on in this country. We convict people in this country based on the burden of proof of beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. In trials like this one, the prosecution puts together puzzles or stories, kind of like the plot of a movie. And there is very different scenes of this movie that they want to put together so that you can come to a conclusion. But at the end of the day, if there's any missing pieces of this puzzle or scenes of this movie, you cannot convict a criminal defendant. Now, in this case, the prosecution has failed to prove to you beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt that Mr. Harris is guilty of assault with a deadly weapon. They built up the opening scene, 
They told you what happened in the bar, and there's plenty of proof to corroborate what happened at Gus's. But they are missing the entire final hour of their movie. The script is empty. They don't have any proof that it even exists. Now, from the beginning, our story, conversely to theirs, has been consistent. No missing scenes in our movie. Gerald gets a call. Gerald goes out with a friend. They have some trouble at the bar. Gerald then goes to his office to do some work and then ends the night with his girlfriend. The end. That is the only story here that is supported by evidence that was brought before you today, which is also the only evidence that you are allowed to consider today. What the evidence does not contain, as I have said multiple times, is anything that shows that my client was in that alleyway with Mr. Fordyce. Now, before you go back to the deliberation room, I want you to also remember why your job here today is so important. A man's life, as well as his liberty, and his liberty interests are at stake based on uncorroborated allegations. You must not allow any opinions or emotions to make your decision regarding my client. You must only use the evidence that was brought here before you today, which isn't by any means sufficient to meet the burden of proof in this case. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why you must find my client, Gerald Harris, not guilty. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the prosecution's closing argument. Just one moment while I get um, an exhibit that I plan to show. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. This case is a case about how on March 3rd, a man's life was turned upside down. Why was it turned upside down? Because that man over there could not let a simple argument in a bar go. And when Mr. Harris stalked Henry Fordyce into that alley, this is the end result. This is the end result right here, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Fordyce, point blank, was hit in the head with a blunt object. When on top of that, he was also caused to miss multiple months of work and suffer multiple skull fractures. Gerald Harris had the intent to cause serious bodily injury to Henry Fordyce, and we have proven every element of assault with a deadly weapon. When deadly weapon comes to mind, most might think of a gun or a knife. However, this category can also include large blunt objects, just like the one Mr. Harris decided to bludgeon Henry Fordyce with. As far as serious bodily injury goes, I want you to take a look at the records, and I want you, when you go back to the deliberation room, to consider for yourselves the multiple skull fractures that were inflicted upon Henry Fordyce, and really come to understand how that man's life was put in danger. You heard what happened when he walked into that bar. You've seen how this man over here talks to women. Heck, you've even heard he testimony that he puts his hands on women. But Mr. Harris wasn't finished there, was he? You heard how the police officers came in there and broke up that fight. But that didn't sit right when Mr. Harris did it. There was no way he could help himself from going back to fight the final round and settle the score. But as we promised to show you in the beginning of the trial, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Harris isn't a man that fights with honor. He stalked Henry into an alleyway and jumped him when he wasn't expecting it and beat him to a pulp. And you even heard afterwards from the bartender that was there that night, who he womanized and made disparaging comments towards, that she saw him drive away shortly after. Based on that, I'd like to submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that the evidence does not lie, unlike this defendant. He assaulted Henry Fordyce with a deadly weapon, and he tries to hide behind the words of his girlfriend, who, as we know, couldn't tell us what time he arrived at her home because she was sleeping. But that's okay, because we do know where he was at midnight, just as the bartender has told you. Based on all of this evidence, there is no doubt that this defendant caused the injuries to Henry in that alleyway. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why you must return a verdict of guilty. Thank you.